Good afternoon. So it's been a little while since our last live Tea for Two, and I'm very excited that this afternoon we're going to be chatting to Ben Johnston from ben jo Benjamin Johnston Design in Houston. He works all over the world. He works all over the US. He is kind of everywhere. And he's a, what I'd call a proper Instagram friend. We've never met. And if we have met, it's just at being at a design event or a design party, but we don't actually know each other other than from chatting on Instagram. I love his work. And I kind of stalked him and asked him to join me on a T for two, which is very exciting. I'm sorry we haven't done T for two the last couple of weeks. As you all know, I was in the Lake District. Well, as you may know, I was in the Lake District for a week, which was absolutely beautiful and came home through Chatsworth and through Hardwick Hall. And if you haven't been, it was absolutely amazing to go to both. You can also go to Haddon Hall on the same on the same sort of route. They're all kind of near each other, but we just did the two. And on the way up, we went to Dumfries House, which was absolutely the most amazing thing. It's got the most wonderful collection of Chippendale furniture that was made for the house in the 1750s. So it's only ever been there. It was all shipped from from London up to Scotland. And then the man who installed it was paid a guinea a day. And he went on the wagon from the harbor to the house, installed the furniture and where it's lived for the last you know, nearly 300 years. So it was an absolutely incredible experience to see all of that. As you may know, Dumfries House, which is not in Dumfries, it's in Ayrshire, um, was saved by the Prince of Wales for the nation. It's part of the Prince of Wales Foundation and the house is open to the public. You can have a wonderful tour through it. It was just an incredible, incredible um, place to go. And I'd been wanting to go for a long time. We were meant to go to Mull, which is why, which is the Isle of Mull in, on the, off the coast of Scotland. And that was why we went to Dumfries House because it was sort of on the way. And then we, because of our new COVID rules, we had to double back and we ended up spending the week at the Lake District. Anyway, um, without much ado, we are going to now go online live with Ben Johnson, who you've all come to see. And he is waiting, I think. And um, we'll go straight into the questions and chat about design and his practice and design in Houston. So I'm just going to press the button and I'm going, we're going to connect and he should moment. And um, if you have any questions, just, you know, pop them up. I don't really read the comments um, too much because I don't want to get you distracted. But if you do have any questions, just ask and there they are. There he is. Ben, how are you? <laughs> Excellent. It's so good to see you, Justin. Very good to see you. Welcome. And um, well, welcome you. to London, really. And, um, <laughs> welcome you. to Houston. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for joining me. I, I know you have a very busy schedule. Last week you were on a shoot. I was, you know, we, it, it was fun. We, we shot a recent project and it was, um, you know how those go. They're, they're an enormous amount of work. I don't think people realize how labor intensive they are, but I really appreciated you also. I'm glad that you were able to get to the, you know, the lake district and go see all those amazing properties. It sounded like you had an absolute incredible time. Yeah, it was amazing. We went to, um, as I was saying, we went to Chatsworth, which I'd never been to before. Went to Hardwick Hall, which was built in 1500s and famously wow. is known as Hardwick Hall, more glass than wall. Um, and so that was spectacular. And on the way up, we went to Dumfries House, which was, which was very, oh, very special. It was really wonderful. That sounds so are lovely. You a Houston boy, are you a Houston boy born and bred? Born and raised. I, uh, I was raised uh, here in Houston. I'm actually a sixth generation Houstonian, which is like, um, like a Smurf. They don't really, people don't think they exist, but they do. Uh, so I, uh, my family came here in like 1845 to this area. And they, uh, you know, one side of our family has always been here. So um, born and raised here in Houston. Fantastic. And so um, how did you get into design? Who, was, who were the early influencers? <laughs> Uh, you know, it's so funny, um, you know, I actually really thought my, you know, growing up in Texas, the idea of becoming an interior designer is not something that's often encouraged um, for a, a young guy. Um, Texas? Architecture. So I actually studied to be an architect. I was, um, you know, that was kind of my first foyer into working in the built environment. And it was a wonderful introduction. And I'm actually super glad I had that career path but it was not ultimately what I wanted to do. And I uh, slowly but surely just accepted opportunities that led me to becoming an interior designer. So that's kind of how it happened. So when you grow up in Houston, what are the options? Do you become an architect or a cowboy? What is it? <laughs> an architect, a cowboy, um, a rodeo clown, I think. Um, 
you can have some opportunities in a, a few different areas. But, you know, in Houston, the real, the big industry is either medical. Uh, people have often heard of the Houston Medical Center. Um, so there's a huge medical community here. And then oil and gas is also, this is considered to be one of the energy yes. capitals. So there's a lot of oil and gas opportunities here as well. Which obviously makes for lots of lovely clients. It does. You know, I'm not complaining. It's been a great place. You know, I always thought, um, you know, I work in other parts of the, the continent, but uh, it's interesting because growing up in Houston, um, it's been lovely because I, I, I felt like it was easy to be, uh, get known in a city like Houston. Um, yeah, I, I'm a dime a dozen in, in New York or LA, but, uh, and I'd be a dime a dozen in London. Uh, but, you know, here in Houston, it's been a great place to have a business. Um, I felt like I had a lot to offer this community. And who influenced you from a design point of view early on? So early on, you know, I've been um, just such a fan of so many incredible um, architects and designers. You know, I'm talking, about, I, I'm talking about sort of in your, in your childhood. And for me, it was my grandmother. I mean, oh, my, mother gets, my mother gets really irritated when I say that because... She, I think she she's like, I want the credit. <laughs> um, but my mother, who was her mother, was, is, was like my muse. She was so stylish and so glamorous and kind of famous for being kind of glamorous in, right. in her world in, in Cape Town, where I grew up. So for you, what was that? What, what was that? Who is that, 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 that thing? That person and that influence, I would say my mom was, as a, was an incredible person, but she was not an elegant person woman, so to speak. Um, but she encouraged me in the arts and every facet. And I'm super thankful for that. I mean, any and everything that I wanted to do artistically, she really, um, you know, was an incredible influence and extremely supportive. Um, but I remember, uh, you, this is kind of a, I don't know if you've seen the movie um, called Empty Mame with Rosalind Russell. It's a kind I of have. a classic. Okay. So for me, that um, I remember that woman was this, you know, larger than life, elegant woman who appreciated design. And I remember watching, I've seen that movie probably a hundred times, if not time. more. And, and I love it every time I watch it. And the design in that, the production design in that movie uh, was so inspiring to me. I think every interior, I just drool over. I've, I've been inspired numerous times from that, from the time I was just a little kid. And so. that apartment that kept every decade kept changing itself up, but it was still the same structure. That was an Can you imagine set design. Dream client, dream client right there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Every what about you? Complete refresh. Yeah. So you, your grandmother was this person. She was this larger than life, elegant woman. Um, I see actually my friend Sippy's just joined the chat and Sippy knew my grandmother very well. Um, oh. she, hey, Sippy. she just was incredibly stylish. And yeah. I've got this photograph, which has actually been in my brochure. I mean, that's how much of a sort of amuse my grandmother was for me. Wow. And it's, she's wearing this incredible sort of turban. Um, and I remember saying to my mother years, a few years ago, you know, that, 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 that hat with granny, you know, that, that turban. She was just so cool and so, so, so cool. And <laughs> it just seemed so effortless. And my mother yes. was like, oh, no, no, no. No, 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 no. It wasn't effortless. She put a lot of thought. A lot of time. Very, she looked effortless. So yes. um, slightly did not burst the bubble, but I just sort of understand what the practice that goes into, into that it's kind true. of elegance, you know. It's um, true. Really, it's so true. Really important. What was your first job? Um, I think my first job was, of course, um, other than mowing lawns and, um, and also babysitting kids in the neighborhood, for, by the way, my across the street neighbor was a well-known designer here in Houston. And so I grew up babysitting her kids and, and she was the first des proper designer I had ever met. Her name's Lynn Jones. And Lynn is so wonderful and, and such a kind woman. And she, she also saw that I had a great interest in design and she really encouraged me. And, and again, it was just lovely to, to um, meet someone from a young age that was a practicing uh, interior designer. Um, but I was just going to say that uh, my first proper job um, was actually I went to go work in Tokyo for Cesar Pelli. Um, Cesar Pelli is a, as you know, is a, is a star architect. Really, that was one of those things that it was an incredible opportunity that I feel blessed to have had. But it also was the one that in convinced Tokyo. me that I didn't want to be an architect in Tokyo, of all places.
So you went from Houston to Tokyo. That's quite a, quite a baptism of fire. Yes, and it was. And I will tell you that that was um, an incredible experience. Have you been to Japan before? No, I've never been to Japan. You need to go at some point. And it is one of those places that uh, is so inspiring. And, um, you know, the practice of, I mean, their ancient architecture is as modern today as it really gets. And it's, um, yeah. it had a big influence on me uh, in terms of my aesthetic. And, you know, I think that's something that has always uh, had an indelible impression upon me. Wow, amazing. I hope you get what to go. Experience. My first job it was, was, it was, you know, I worked in a friend's deli. You know, nothing quite as glamorous <laughs> as, 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 going, as going to Japan. Um, when and how did you find your practice? Did, was that coming back from Japan or was it, um, was it years later? Or how did that, how, what was that process for you? That process was a kind of an organic one. Um, and I think, again, this is kind of what I, I mentioned earlier, which was that I didn't really set out to be an interior designer. And yeah. I think and in, in some cases, that's the way it should be for me. And anyway, I, I kind of just said yes to many opportunities that uh, went from me coming back from Japan. I kind of put out my shingle as a as a designer because I couldn't call myself an architect because I didn't I was not pursuing architecture in that in yeah. that fashion anymore. And I wasn't an interior designer at the time. Um, so I just kind of put my shingle out there and I did everything from designing business cards for friends and uh, and from business uh, other you know clients that saw what I had done and liked it to designing websites and furniture. And um, I think that was actually me saying yes to doing furniture was restaurants, it was mainly for restaurants. And people would go into the restaurants and they would see all these banquettes and bars and host stands and, and things that we had designed and built and said, you know, I really love that. Could you do something like that for me in my home? And I said, you know, sure, yes, I'm, I'm happy to do it. And that led me to then them saying, you know, well, we really love what you did in our, you know, for our dining room. Could you also do our living room and can you do our bedroom and can you do our kitchen? And, and slowly but surely, probably after about six years of this, I realized I had become an interior designer without ever having set out to be one. And, um, and then also, and I, I also got around that time, I got asked to teach at a local university here in Houston to teach interior design classes and in the interior design department. And um, I thought that was a lovely diversion, uh, but it was like going back to school for something I had inherently been practicing. And it was through that that I kind of solidified my plan to, to really focus on doing interior design and creating a design practice. And that's kind of how it happened. And, and you, you haven't just focused on Houston. You've made, um, what I said in my, in my questions to you, that the transition from doing those huge sort of Texas houses, and we used to say in London, you know, that you know, people used to buy, in, in, in South Africa where I come from, they are the same, so it's the same sort of scale as houses in Texas. And people, we used to say people would buy a sofa in South Africa that's cool for Texas, they would arrive <laughs> in London and get stuck in the front door. Um, exactly. You have made that transition from designing those big sprawling spaces to what you call vertical design, so high rise yeah. design. Um, yeah. And then you've gone back again. What, what was the challenge in going from doing that, that kind of big sprawling space to a more vertical kind of living? You know, uh, that's a great question. Um, I would say the challenge is scale, um, but of a different kind. Um, you know, I would say that doing having the experience um, in Texas, you know, I, the houses that we work on can be anywhere from um, 5,000 square feet to a recent project that we're going to be starting on is, is over 20,000 square feet. Um, I mean, so places. these are big, big homes, big, big uh, estates. And, uh, you know, it just, I think you just have to go into it with the um, idea that you can't do this alone and you have to rely on team members and associate yourself with people who have experience doing it. And so um, this is, if nothing else, the most humbling career. It teaches you literally how much you don't know uh, very, very quickly. <laughs> and um, so what I was going to mention, though, is that, you know, we had um, started working on high rises. We've um, been asked to do redo the Warwick Towers, which is a kind of a historic building, historic by Houston standards, um, you know, residential high rise. And we've been redoing all the common areas for them. Uh, but we've also been working in a lot of wonderful um, 
you know, wonderful vertical living um, buildings all over New York, New Jersey, um, and uh, also one in, in Montreal. And um, it's just given us, and we're actually interviewing for yet another one today. Um, so it will, we'll see how it goes. It's just been, um, it's just been about building the team that can handle it really. And obviously when you are installing in a different city for the first time, that's oh. a massive challenge. It really is. So I, I know you've done this before. Um, and I will say I, I have to be very selective about the projects I take out of town because it's like you have to reinvent the wheel. Um, you know, things that, you know, you're as good as your, your, your team that you associate yourself with. And if you're having to reassociate yourself with new contractors, new installers, new furniture receivers, um, new everything, new electricians, it's, it can be a challenge. You have to really do your homework. And, and, you know, we're both part of the design leadership network. And I have, I've reached out to many of our friends and our colleagues in the community and said, Hey, I'm going to be doing a project in your area and I need help. I need some, I need to dial a friend here to kind of find out who you're using for your drapery workroom, uh, who you're using yeah, as a wall covering installer. You're absolutely right. We had a crazy situation where we sent last summer, we sent three desks to the same receiver and somehow they got mixed up, but one of them only installed this summer and the other <sighs> two got installed and they, we never really heard there was never an issue. And she called and said, my desk doesn't have the cable management thing. We were like, sent her the pictures of the desk from the workshop floor, said, yes, they do. She was like, no, they don't. And I was like, <laughs> this is just really weird because I'm looking at the one picture of your desk and another picture of your desk and you know, it's just not there. And then I realized- So weird. That desk in the same, well, not actually the same, but a very similar finish, ended up at somebody else's house. They didn't realize they installed it. They finished their project eight months ago. This project had been delayed for various reasons, but she had ordered it with this thing. And so I actually reached out to the guy in my DLN, my Design Leadership Network um, group, and I, who, was in the, who, who works in the same district. And I said, just by coincidence, I said, I need someone to go and put a thing in. He was like, oh, I've got the perfect craftsman for you. And he, I got a number, Brian went there, he did it. She, the same designer then had some other issues with something else that I don't know what, what but she said, you, would you mind if I contracted your, I said, you know, my guy is, you know. And okay. so he's now got other work from it. And the whole thing is just a really happy solution. From that what is so quite a big problem for me. It, well, you know? and it's and you, as you know, it's funny. I I try to weave some romance for my clients because the number of things that can go wrong in our business is <laughs> just staggering. And I and I try the romance that I try to weave for them as as I say, you know, um, you know, the idea of luxury is 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 a space built by a, a thousand hands. I mean, the idea every single thing has been touched by hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people before it ever arrived in your living room. Um, yeah. It's been labored over. And uh, at the same time, I, I try to give them this romantic idea and this notion that these products are coming from all over the world and hundreds of people have, have made this happen for you, um, if not thousands, then I also say that any one of those people could have made a mistake. Um, and one little mistake in the production line can cause major headaches on the back end. And we shield our clients from all of that uh, drama. <laughs> it can be drama. And we just have to handle it. Um, so you're right. It's, it's one of those things that it, it's wonderful to think about all of the people who help make a project happen. And it's also scary because you have so much that's out of your control. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, for instance, at the moment, we're doing um, one piece of furniture for a client in the US. Um, that's a very detailed piece of furniture. There's a hand-carved, there's a hand-carved cornice. It's oh, then nice. gessoed and gilded. There's a, um, a hand-carved foot that is gilded. There is um, quite a lot of mechanical stuff on the inside to make it kind of work for a modern space. It's then got, to be, space, yeah. it's then got to be sprayed. It's then got to be hand-waxed, et cetera, et cetera. And you've probably wow. got about sort of 15 or 16 different craftsmen working working on this one on this piece. One piece. Before I even, but you know, after where I go from design to manufacture, there are about 15 crafts from working on it before it gets assembled into one piece. That's um, incredible. And, and it's, it's an amazing process. But as you say, you know, one thing can go right and that can cause huge delays. Like for instance, our one carver got COVID. And believe me, it's not a hoax. <laughs> you know? I know. Um, he's, <laughs> and he's not taking on any more work for the rest of the year. So we've had to, we, he's had to recommend sort of, apprentices and other people who've, who've done work for him. Um, 
because you know he can't he, you know there's a particular stool which we're doing for for another client in London that he's just said I can't do that project I just I I I just haven't got the energy um yeah. so we are you know we there's jug, we're juggling a lot and it's not you know it's not um it's not rocket science and it's not um saving saving the world but it's challenging and it's it's super um, challenging and there's huge amounts of coordination that go into it mm. well um, i'm impressed got, and i've I will... got a young woman who works in my office who does uh, um, our production coordination and every day i go and why do we know that and she goes because we're better than we were yesterday because <laughs> every day we get better at knowing where we are failing we're only interested in our failures our successes right. are not i mean they're great but we're only really interested in focusing on our failures so, right. so every day we're focusing on something and, get, and getting better and every day after say why and why how, why do we know that just because we're getting better <laughs> 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 but you know it's, it's it's one of those things that I keep thinking that this um I keep thinking that this is going to get easier um because we will have not made that same mistake twice. I mean as I always call it it's only a mistake if you do it twice. Um it's not a mistake if you've done it once because uh, you've learned from it. Um but the the fact is is that I I guess keep getting humbled because I keep learning new things that I did not know. um that were painful to learn and i keep thinking gosh is there ever going to be a point where this is kind of works like um seamlessly and without any hiccups and i'm afraid the answer to that question is probably no <laughs> the thing is the thing is that um with 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 something with, with something like that is your work is not cookie cutter work okay no. so you make a mistake and then you apply that to a much more detailed interior in your next project which then right. keep raising the bar and if you are anything like me or, or like you when i which i know from from looking at your work you keep raising the bar so you 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 Try. you you start you know you start off with a gilded foot and then you end up with a completely you know you keep change pushing the envelope and and making and making the work more detailed which is a nightmare for a lot of your vendors <laughs> but actually that's the work that they like doing they do and i think honestly like we're we're on a project right now a couple projects that we're doing um a lot of we're doing all the material selections for and it's funny because i keep saying you know i've seen all the standard countertop profiles that have ever been invented so far let's do ones that we haven't seen before and the funniest thing is is that the everybody looks at us like well isn't there isn't what is already exists on the market can't you just pick one and i'm like no because i want to do something that no one's seen before you know like i want to create a different profile that and then i quickly start to learn you know like sometimes i'll learn yes this was a great idea and i it should be like in, like in the lexicon of normal countertop profiles and then other times you like oh wow i just created such a unworkable mess that is i'm going to you know i'm going to be humbled by uh so you know you learn you learn some really cool things and you do push the boundaries on every single project or you try yeah well exactly what is your favorite room in the house oh i would have to say my bedroom because i can go to sleep um because sleep is good and i like it <laughs> what about you what's your favorite bedroom um, oh no i know my i i'm the favorite, favorite room, room i should say i would say for me is the dining room um Dining I believe rooms. in dining rooms. I I love, I love the dining them. room. I love I love setting a table. I like a tablescape. I like I like I like entertaining. I like cooking. I yeah. And even I mean most of the time if we are entertaining we'll probably eat in the kitchen. Particularly at the moment we're only allowed to have um six people to a dinner. But I right. will I'd say that yeah the uh, setting a ta- there's something about the sense of occasion of setting a table and creating an, a, a space that people can kind of just engage and enjoy and i i i love i like a dining room and my dining room at home i particularly love um i've I, seen walls, photos of it it is gorgeous yeah there's a scenic it's it's a scenic room um and it's a i basically took a constable john constable's um painting of wivenhoe park which was done in 1815 oh, wow. which is kind of about that my house is built between our house is built between 1792 and and 1840 so it's sort of the right period and it basically wraps three rooms of the di- three walls of the dining room because it's it's an open ended room and it's not a particularly attractive room and so going into it it just feels very pastoral and it's lovely it's really fun I and love you know, that. it's got a big table in it and now that we're only like, only six people we i had a friend who I hadn't seen for years who um 
who, who who's called Oliver, who I who we call Weezer Boudreau um, as a nickname. <laughs> and so I had Weezer Boudreau for dinner. So I thought, well, I couldn't possibly sort of have Weezer Boudreau in the kitchen. And um, so we sat in the dining room, just the six of us. But actually, it was very, very comfortable. It didn't feel that we were sort of rattling around in this big sort of room. And it's not a huge room, but um, it's usually right. a, a more of a 10 to 12 people room. But it was, it was really good fun for, for Weezer Boudreau. You know, I, you know, I get asked by clients who have these large spaces. They say, you know, well, we only feel comfortable using our formal dining room if we have 10 to 12 people. And I said, no, 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 this is a mistake. And I and I tell them, I'm like, you can set the ends of the table with like the second or third course. You can put all the, you know, the, the beverages, the wine and everything on one end of the table. And you can have an intimate setting right at the center of the table and yes. use the rest of the table for tablescape and everything. And it, I think it creates a very lux luxurious, intimate you know, gathering. And I, I encourage clients to use their dining, formal dining rooms a lot more than they do. Yeah, no, I think you're absolutely right. So on, my, my, my table is a big sort of d end table. And what yeah. I did on Saturday night is that on the ends of them, we sat, as you say, in the middle. And on the ends of it, I put these big can candelabras. And so it kind of contained it's the space. Perfect. I brought it in a bit, which was, which was amazing. Yeah. But back to you. And magical. What is the secret yeah, yeah, yeah. Of, a, of a happy client relationship? <sighs> communication, communication, communication. I mean, <laughs> I, I mean, if I, I always tell our clients that um, it's a two way street, though, and I have to really, you know, we have to have a lot of conversations where we need their utmost uh, absolute honesty, and we need feedback and feedback is our friend. And, and I think clients need to know that they they can trust you and that you're um, communicating with them and the the ways that they need to feel communicated to. Uh, so I would say that's the secret is just really refining and, and stepping up the communication at every step of the process. What and is, ben, what what's is your secret? Oh, okay. Well, you're going to have to share your secret. It's really, yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, and um, so, and the secret is that you, is that uh, I don't do I don't do a lot of interior design anymore. Um, I, I I I very much focus on product, and um, yeah. it's, but the interior design that I do do is if there's an amazing house that comes comes my way that I I think oh yeah or or gotta get my hands call, on it yeah or or they're what I call legacy clients you know people who who when I was doing a lot of interior design um who come to me and they want more done or they want to revamp. I'm, I'm just started work. We did the first, in, first bit of installation today on an apartment in London that um, 11 years ago, clients of mine, I, I, did a, I turned two apartments into one for them. They then, sold oh, lovely. In 20, they then sold it in 2014 and I did it for the new people. And they wow. sold, the new people sold at the beginning of this year. And, it's, and, and so the new, new people have asked me to do some more stuff. Um, that, 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 wow. that, that's a great, a great thing to do. Except when you get these challenging questions like, well, what would you do if this was your space? And I'm like, well, that's what I did the first time. Because the, actually the clients, who, the clients who I did it for the first time, I, I've actually done five houses for that family. And they're, wow. you know, they're great legacy clients. And they, you know, I worked very well with them. So it's quite challenging to then do something new when we, were, we really kind of pushed the boat in, on the first one. But yeah, it's it's about relationships and it's about um, it's about trust and relationships and right. people. For me, I think my my legacy clients come to me because they know they're going to get the answer that I would give them if it were my own house. I once stood right. I once stood with a client in an installation for a bathroom and she was having a big party, and this was like the last bathroom and they were going to be moving in like three days later, and I and I had worked out that the stone people had supplied two pallets of different colored stone, creme of creme and creme of ivory or whatever it was. And they oh, just, more. every oh, third more. or fourth piece of stone looked and off color, it looked a little bit like a bad tooth in, in, oh. the, in, in the layout. And her husband said, I'm sure it's fine. And she looked at me and she said, what do you think? I said, it's not right. And she said, well, if this was your house, what would you do? And I said, I'd take it off. The party be damned, I'll take it out. And, right. um, and we did. And, it, and the, the, the contractor was furious. And I remember the project manager phoned me afterwards and said, 
The husband said it was fine. I was like, but it wasn't fine, you know? And so I think people kind of, right. people like that kind of honest answer. They like that, that approach, um, that approach right. to it. Um, yeah. How have you felt the impact of COVID? Or haven't you? Um, I don't know. Well, you know, I'll say that it's been, um, you know, a challenge for all of us. I think that, uh, you know, we, we were fortunate because we had a lot of projects under construction before COVID. And as a result of um, the some of the, the loopholes and the, the law, they basically said that home, home building was considered an essential service. And we had so much work going on with under construction that we were not actually able to take a break. Um, so we spent many weeks um, distance uh, officing and, and trying to make it work with my whole team kind of in their homes and, and us doing it. But as you know, our work is so um, tactile and so uh, in person. And, and we have to look at fabrics. We have to look at materials. We have to do all this stuff. Um, and, and collaboration is a, a huge part of our, our process. And it was really difficult. I, I'm not going to lie. It made me appreciate uh, our collaborations in person even more. Um, and so, you know, now um, we, we've stayed really busy. And, and luckily, it hasn't affected the local economy too bad, um, and or at least our clientele. And, and so we are still moving forward. I mean, um, keep on keeping on, right? Yeah, that's right. Now, tell me, there is a design thread. I mean, if I look at if I look at the all powerful Instagram grid of the Benjamin Johnson interiors, the Benjamin Johnson design, um, and there's a magic there. Um, Thank you. I, I think. Um, wh but what would you say is is the design thread that you weave through through your different projects that gives it that that magic? Um, well, I appreciate you saying that. That's very very kind of you, um, especially coming from someone I admire so much. Um, Thank you. So for, for me, I, I would say that um, I, I just bring my lens to the process. Um, I try very hard to, I use a tagline for what the work that we do, um, but the tagline is actually so much more. It's actually the process that we use um, to, yeah. to work with clients. So we use the three terms, classic, curated, and cool. And, and I tell my clients um, that what, for, what that means to us and what we'll try to do for them is that we try to do interiors that stand the test of time, hence the classic. And we do that by curating a mix of time periods and, um, and uh, backgrounds and, and origins and, and um, different cultures all together into a space. Um, time, you know, and, and not just do new products, but do uh, antiques and vintage pieces. And we try to blend all that together. Um, and then ultimately, we ask them to bring their cool. Like we want to create the best version of themselves where they're putting their best foot forward and it's their best reflection. So again, it's about being classic. It's about being curating a, a beautiful space. And it's about being their best reflection and bringing their cool. So I would say that the thread that weaves through all of our work is to bring all those three elements together, even if the the interior or the architecture is different. We're looking for those, that, using that lens to really look through the process and the project. And the, the, the cool is the, is the client specific part. Exactly, and that's what they, we want them to bring it. We want them to tell us about things they've collected and interests that they have and what they find to be beautiful and, and um, get to know their families and get to know their personalities. I mean, it was funny, one of the, um, you know, one of our, clients that we just were re working with was just the most friendly people. And I kept on saying, as I found myself saying, you know, I was picking fabrics. Well, this is one that they're going to like it so friendly. It's a friendly fabric. You know, and it's funny because I've, I've never really thought about fabrics or as interiors as friendly. Um, but for them, I was, that was that element of, of their story that I was drawn to. I was like, that's what makes them unique as a family. Yeah. That's fantastic. I, I remember one of my very, so when I, my first job in London, I worked for Nikki Haslam and we went to see a client oh, who, wow. who, who had this thing about fabrics and she said they couldn't be hot on the bum, um, <laughs> which meant that, that if you sat on the fabric naked, it couldn't yes. be hot. So it could, she didn't want to have a velvet or a, um, she, or she didn't want to have a mohair velvet, she wanted more of a silk velvet so it was cooler. Um, right. And she was happy with the linens, but she didn't like boucles because boucles were hot on the bum. 
Um, that and is I, so I've funny. Always, I've always remembered that expression. And she was hot on um, the bum. She yeah, she didn't like having someone hot on the bum, um, which I always think was really interesting. Now, um, Ben, tell me, you do a huge amount of bespoke work, um, according to my re my, my research, um, with Chadwick. Yes. And they deliver a great, a great and beautiful product. And um, Thank we've you. been in some of the showrooms with them. And they offer a bespoke, a, a bespoke service that you utilize a lot. Um, I do. How do you achieve a product that from a, how do you achieve a design? And this is quite a, I did not actually, I, I'm wording, sorry. And I was, you know, this can find you slightly unprepared because I haven't actually asked you this question this way. How no, do no you worries. Achieve, how do you achieve a, a look of a product that is your, um, it's got your signature and it doesn't look like it comes from a design house that, um, that has, that has their own big collection. So, you know, for the people who don't know, Chaddock has a, has a fine home furniture collection. They, they, they have their own line. They do a lot of licensed products of, of, of beautiful work, but you do a huge amount of, if I'm, if I'm correct, a huge amount of bespoke work with them. We and do. You achieve, you achieve a look that isn't just their house look. How do correct. you do that? That's a that's a great question. So um, a couple of things that to, that's unique about Chaddock as a furniture company is that um, I mean they have over like fifty finishes uh, for wood frames. I mean they have you can do any com fabric, you can do any nail head, any trim, any anything that you want to to any of their frames. So what's really special is that. You can, you know, they have these incredible collections with Guy Chaddock, who obviously the, the birthplace of the, of the um, collection uh, for Chaddock was created by Guy Chaddock. And then you have people like Mary McDonald who's come in and, and created her own collection. And Mark Sykes recently created a collection for them. Um, and Mary McDonald's each one of their- an amazing center table that you've used. Um, it's a really- I love that table. A scallop table, it's a really special table. It's gorgeous. And, 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 you know, what they do is they bring that um, kind of tradition of, of, of craftsmanship and furniture making. And they've got these, because they have these frames that have been created um, by so many wonderful, you know, designers, um, there's something in that collection for everybody. And so there's many pieces that I've drawn, I'm super drawn to, and I've wanted to customize and do stuff with um, and make them fresh and new for me and for my clients. So I just would say they're super easy to um, kind of look and do something unique with those pieces. Uh, so I'm excited. And I've also, they have all this made to measure furniture where you'll take one of their pieces and you can say, well, I don't want it as a six person dining table. I want it as a 12 person dining table and they'll re-engineer the table to make it work. Um, yeah. You can say, I like this base from this table, but I want it with this top and they'll allow you to recombine it. So. I think that that's one of the magical things about that company is how customizable it really is. Yeah, and they seem to go to, to the nth degree to, you know, to, to, to satisfy. They never say no. <laughs> they never say no. They always say, yeah, we'll make it work. What's next for you? Oh, Lord. Um, what's next <laughs> for me is I have been um, really looking forward to some, uh, we've been, you know, it's, I've been really looking forward to some downtime, to be honest. So I'm looking forward to the holidays coming up and I'm hoping I get a little bit of, um, you know, uh, downtime. Normally we, we get a bit of a slowdown, which I always look forward to, but um, right now it's kind of, it hasn't, it's not shaping up that way. We have a lot of deadlines that are hitting right at the first of the year. So most likely we're not gonna get a, uh, the much needed break. However, I'm, I'm really hoping, um, that international travel gets opened up again. Um, I really want, I turned 40 this year and I wanted to go on a big trip. I wanted to go to New Zealand actually, or to South Africa, one of the two. I've never been to either one of those, uh, those countries. And um, so I was super excited to do that. And then of course this whole thing hit, so we canceled our plans. Um, but uh, so I'm looking for some travel. Um, Business wise or, or professionally speaking, we have a lot of irons in the fire and um, some I can talk about and some I can't, but I'm, I'm just super excited. It's shaping up to be a great year. We did just launch a collection that's coming out this month, but we should be getting our first rugs um, with a, a beautiful rug manufacturer, Madison Lily Rugs. And we have a collection that's coming out um, this year and then uh, this month. Hold on, hold on, and then, hold on. So just tell me about that. Yeah. 
Okay. Um, so yes. So Madison Lily is um, does this beautiful product. It's from all over Nepal. I mean, from Nepal and India. Yeah. Tan knotted rugs. And they asked me to do a collection of for them. And I got very inspired by nature because I was wanting to take flight out of the city, um, as many of us have wanted to do. And so this was a COVID collection. Like I designed it during COVID. <laughs> I love that. And, and um and so these rugs are coming in and what we did was we took bird wings and we kind of abstracted the bird wings and we um created these beautiful rugs that are very painterly uh, and and form and fashion and and i think very striking um, but i was also inspired by the kind of the art of the tapestry and i wanted a rug that was so beautiful you would be willing to hang it on your wall as an art piece as opposed to just as uh, something you walk on or put on the floor um, so we created this collection and it's, it's, a, it's a small collection and then we're coming out with another collection um, very different from that for them and the spring. So uh, we have two collections coming out with them. So we're excited. Fantastic. Congratulations. Thank you. It's fun. I enjoy, I enjoy collaborating with it. And I also, like you, I, I get excited about the fact that these products have a life outside of my own, my own um, um, catalog of work or portfolio. I like the idea yes. that other people could be inspired by them and use them in their own way. And I, I am excited to see what people do with this collection. Yeah, we've, you know, we did this, um, I did this return collection last, at the, um, at the end of last I've year. I've seen it, it's gorgeous. And it's, it's, it's a really beautiful collection. It's hand woven by the blind in South Africa. So it's an amazing charity collection. And Veer Grenny, I sort of press ganged Veer into, um, designing a bed and he designed a few pieces in this beautiful bed, such a beautiful oh. bed. And um, he's now come to us and said, um, I want a bed. And we were like, okay, that's great. And he was like, yeah, but not my bed. <laughs> and I, we were like, what? And, and, he's, and so his, his studio is busy designing a different bed. And I find that really exciting. And yeah, done, that's cool. And we've done a swing bed for a, for a turret in a, for another London designer, for a turret in a tower. And how magical. Um, it's absolutely magical. And so people are coming to us, these wonderful sort of custom ideas, and so slightly way out ideas, um, and saying, can you weave it like this and do that? And it's, it's, it's really inspiring. As you say, that it goes out of the portfolio, it goes out of the catalog. It, it, it goes into, a, into that whole realm of creative thought that is then outside my, your own wheelhouse. Because yes. from a commercial point of view, I would never produce a swing bench and put it in my, on my website to sell. But somebody saw one of the designs and thought, ah, oh, hang on, they could weave that, be, you know, and that and that that's really exciting. But you've inspired. That's the that's the coolest part, and that's why I get excited about it too. Is that you're inspiring other designers um, to do something outside, and and you get to see your work kind of take on its own life. That's so cool. Exactly. Now, so you where will if, okay? You wanted to go to New Zealand. You keen to go to South Africa. Um, you can't go to South Africa without touching base with me first. Um, <laughs> Perfect. But but. Um, where feasibly do you think international travel will take you? Well, so the only country that will have the dirty Americans um, that we are is um, Mexico is the only country that's opened up. Um, so I know that there is um, some plans for that. And there's some beautiful people don't understand how beautiful Mexico is. Yeah. There are some places of just sublime beauty there. Um, we and were it's meant such to a go rich to Mexico now for DLN and it's canceled. Canceled. I know. Um, very sad about that, um, but understandable con uh, considering the situation. But um, I probably will go there. And then I think Costa Rica I've been to before. Um, they're also about to reopen up to Americans. They're like the only two countries that I know of that will allow us to travel. <laughs> what about you? I was, Where I, well, I was meant to be going back to that. We have a new collection launching um, next, um, next spring, which is not a, a collaborative collection. It's an in-house collection of our own, wow. it's sort of pulling our whole African wheelhouse together. So we produce these How beautiful cool. mohair, mohair, um, fine weave mohair textiles, and we produce these beautiful mohair woven um, floor rugs, and we do the rattan. I need to and see we, those. And we can make furniture and stuff. And, um, and so that's very, very exciting. And so we've done a collection which is just finishing up sort of um, design prototype at the moment called Safari, and it's gonna be so sort of Justin Bambada, Africa, and it's going to be this beautiful safari collection, which we're going to be launching in the spring. And I'm meant to be going out in two weeks' time to sort of start, you know, kind of pulling all the different elements together. Um, and I'm talking with amazing sort of saddle makers um, to do the leather components and 
and I can't go. They've just closed. They opened the border and now they've closed the border. So I can't go. And I was literally on the phone to my mum, who's done all our um, quality control for about the last sort of 18 years. My mother's been involved in, in the business doing quality control. That's a good person like, to trust. Yeah. And I was like, well, you... mum, what are you doing the next six months? And she was like, why? <laughs> She's like, I can't really go anywhere because the South Africa borders are closed. And I was like, right. well, because I think I'm going to really need you to, 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 to pull this together. And she was like, fine. But, but I had to do this and this day, and I do that and that day, and I was like, that's fine. <laughs> we'll, she doesn't we'll want her schedule around. thrown off. <laughs> yeah, we'll work around you, you know. And tell me, um, Ben, what have you been eating or cooking during COVID? Have you been making um, banana bread or sourdough bread like everybody else? <laughs> I am, so I, I know that, you know, I'll, unlike you, my gifts uh, in the home do not extend to cooking. I am um, actually quite terrible in the kitchen. Uh, so I've been doing just a lot of the uh, COVID drinking um, just to, <laughs> um, just to pass the time. Um, but, you know, I will say that's, I ha honestly, I haven't been making much of anything I, I, I'm terrible. I'll make a pizza. I make pizzas all the time. Um, and I'm, I'm, I love pizza. So I'll make pizza and that's about it. And so I've, I've asked a lot of the people who've been on these, on these, on these chats, you know, what they've missed the most during COVID. But I, um, something that has emerged is that a lot of people are seeing the blessings of this time as the time goes longer true. and longer. And we're going back into a much bigger lockdown in London. It's, um, it's quite, it's quite scary what's happening. The countries are closing to the UK. Um, we are, you know, Scotland's closing its borders. It's, it's really becoming much, everything's much tighter. You can only have six people for dinner. Um, in wow. certain areas, households can't mix outside of their households. It's kind of like, oh my goodness. Um, it's like and, the same thing you know, over Christmas again. Christmas is canceled. Um, you know, it's, it's all a bit sort of, a bit, a bit hectic. But a lot of people are seeing the blessings. Do you, for you, is there, has it been something you've missed or is there something that's been, a, been an amazing blessing during this time? Um, so what I, I would say that I have, it's been highlighted to me is I have realized how much I, um, again, appreciate collaboration. I appreciate people. I'm kind of, you know, I, I used to always think of myself as a bit of a, you know, um, a lone, a lone wolf a little bit, you know, like, um, I, I used to think of myself as, a, as not needing people as much um, in the same, like, from a personal connection standpoint. Um, but what's interesting is that I've, I've highlighted how much I actually adore uh, and need personal connection. Um, and I've also, I'm a kind of, despite what I just said, I also like really love hugging people. And I love you know, human touch and, and seeing people that I really care about um that i would want to give a hug to and i've also realized how much i really miss that and i i miss um you know seeing people um it's all highlighted by the fact that we are not doing any of that now um yeah. so you know it just makes you appreciate the the day-to-day -day stuff that you would kind of took for granted before no absolutely i mean to tell you a little story and i've kept you I've kept you far, far longer no than I, than I i've enjoyed it but um, a great, um, we had a weekend um, about three months ago where when things sort of eased up a bit, we had some friends join us for the weekend and they drove sort of three and a half hours to get to us and they stopped at a, at a, at a what you call a gas station to, to fill up their car. And there was a sort of a picnic area on the side and she saw two cars pull up and there was an elderly couple got out and a younger couple got out and it was very clearly a sort of a parental situation. Um, but it was sort of, people in their 70s and people in their 30s. And then wow. they held up this huge sort of cling film, sort of plastic sheet. And then they put that and they hugged through that. No. To, and and <laughs> this friend of mine said she was sitting filling up her car and it just brought tears to her eyes and that, that these people were just craving this connection, you know. So bad. And, and there was this wonderful idea of this sort of very fine cling film sheet and then just sort of hugging through that, which I, <laughs> which I thought was wonderful. But I may need to get that for, for the time. office. Of course. I have absolutely loved speaking to you. And, Likewise. Um, and it's been, been absolutely wonderful. So big cyber hug. And, um, and I'm looking very much forward to looking at your, your Madison Lily. Everyone check out Madison Lily for, um, for Ben's new, Ben's new rack you. collection, which is coming out shortly. And, and thank you so much for, for your Justin, time. Really, it's such really a pleasure. Appreciate. And I, I, I hope that next time we see each other in a room like we did in London last yes, year, um, that we actually have the opportunity to get over to each other and actually say hello properly.
And yeah, that was the craziest. It was for me. It was my very first, my very first series of DLN events. It was it, it was crazy, and it was it was inspiring. And you, the the US um, design community is is fantastic. And my friend Mike is on this on this. Mike, I can't even we can't we haven't connected in so long. But Mike is one. Mike and the company he works for is a Mommy Stone based in Atlanta, and they're one of the reasons yep. we joined the DLN because they are very proactive members and. Um, and they just said to us, come on, guys, just it's time, it's time to join and just get to be part of this, which, which is what we do. Well, I was so, thrilled to see you there. And, and I, hope, I hope we get a chance to get to Mexico after this anyway. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. All okay, right. Okay, well, take, take care, care of yourself. Love to speak to you. Bye. All right. Bye. Bye. Okay, so guys, I thought that was really fun and really cool. And I know I took up much longer than I expected to. But um, talking to Ben Johnson, look at Madison Lily for his rugs. Um, look on his Instagram, which is very beautiful. And there are quite a lot of live video tours of houses and things that are really fantastic. And um, so they have a really, um, really beautiful work and a, a, a very clearly a lovely design philosophy of what do they bring? Cur it's, 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 it's classic, cool, and curated. And then the clients bring the cool. And I love that. So if you, if you are a client, if you're not in the design business and you are watching this, think about what your cool is and um, bring that to your home. Um, we'll be back with another tea for two shortly. And let me, let me know if you need any questions or need anything. Um, but I will be posting, um, I'll be posting who our next guest is very soon. Thank you so much for your time. Bye.